Rugby on Off The Ball. You are very welcome along. Now, Catherine Dane is an Irish rugby player, a physiotherapist, a PhD candidate and a coach. And I'm delighted to say that she is with us here in studio. Catherine, I usually am very thankful for anybody giving up their time to be with us here in studio. I'm especially thankful that uh, you've taken some time out to be here with us. Uh, a lot going on at the moment, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, I've been I've been all over the place at the moment. Uh, very lucky that my PhD has taken me to Monaco, to Sydney and Melbourne um, for presentations, a uh, bit of collaboration and a bit of, bit of holiday mixed in there as well. So I've uh, been, been really enjoying myself. The trip looked fascinating, but the research is uh, the thing I want to talk to you about. Can you talk us through what you're a PhD candidate in? Yeah, so I'm doing my PhD out of Trinity, um, specifically looking at tackle safety and performance in women's rugby union. Um, I think that it's an area that's been underrepresented in the research space. We've got loads of tackle research in, in men's rugby that's been used to inform tackle law changes and coaching resources, but there really wasn't anything in place when I started my PhD four years ago. Um, so I thought, oh, better give, better give this a look, um, given my own playing career and um, the knowledge that yeah, the playing contexts are quite different. I thought it was quite important to, to have a look at this. What was the initial difference when you analysed the measures that are in place, for example, in the men's game and the women's game? So I started off just, just with a scoping review of, of, the, of the evidence. There was very, very little um, research out there. Then I went on to do qualitative interviews with players um, to kind of capture their experiences of tackle safety and performance. And what struck me was that there was a lot of challenges within the performance context. Uh, especially re- relating to like a lack of resources, um, kind of disparities in, in the level of coaching that they were getting as well. The tackling was kind of regarded as a bit of an afterthought. And there, right. were, there were some players that had kind of played their first game of rugby before even being introduced to tackling in training, which right. is quite frightening and, and obviously not very conducive to, to safe um, tackling in, in the game. So um, that led to a lot of injuries and a lot of fears and, and lack of confidence in their tackling ability. Are we talking senior players here that that had been playing before getting a proper breakdown of how to tackle? Yeah, these are these are um, women um, of eighteen years and above, uh, from community level game to university, professional, elite, internationals. There were one or two players that played their first game of international sevens before ever making a tackle. No way. Yep. That's extraordinary. <laughs> I dare say, if you said that to any man who's been playing rugby all the way up through the ranks, they would find that absolutely incredible that there couldn't be a detailed instruction. And it's pretty obvious why that is, but you've obviously got a lot more detail on the safety aspect of, of why teaching people to tackle properly is so important. It's a really complex skill and, and there's lots involved. I don't know if you've ever played rugby before or tackled anyone. Yeah, very, very little. <laughs> <laughs> there's, lo- there's loads involved. I mean, there's technical skills, there's tactical decision making, there's psychological processes and... Um, yeah, just like physical robustness as well. Like how do we make sure that players are equipped to, to do all that and um, prepared to execute it safely and effectively when it comes to match day? What is the one thing that people are doing wrong when it comes to tackling them? When you're looking at these people who've been playing rugby and have not been taught properly how to tackle, is there a common error that they're making? A common error? Oh, there's so many different things involved. Um we, in research terms, we split the tackle into pre-contact, contact and post-contact. Um, and particularly in the, in the women's game, in the pre-contact phase, we would find that they just don't really quite get their footwork right coming into contact, which means that they're exposed. Maybe they're, they're not making initial contact with their shoulder. They're maybe using their torso, which is then putting them in closer proximity to, to their head, getting initial contact. Um, when it comes to the contact themselves, we find um, that lack of proper wrap on the ball carrier gets in place and then you have your tackle breaks and offloads and things like that. So a um, combination of, of pre-contact, getting their tackle height down as well and making the right initial contact is probably some of the key areas that it needs working on. Which leads to, I presume, dangerous contact in a number of situations. Yeah, we want to try and mitigate as many head contacts as possible in the women's game. Um, I'm sure you've seen the instrumental mouth guards and the, the tackle height law changes in, in an effort to try and reduce the space between the, the ball carrier's head and, and, and the tackler. Um, so similarly for the tackler itself, it's it's trying to get yourself into a safer zone that you can get, keep your head out of the way and make initial contact with the shoulder. When you're watching Ireland play in the Women's Six Nations, and obviously from your own experience of having played with the team yourself, are you seeing at that level even 
uh, difference in tackle technique and um, tackle standard compared to the men's game, or is that is that level of the game okay? I think I think it's definitely improving. Um, in terms of the technical characteristics of the tackle, it's probably a little bit different between the men's game, but tactically, uh, I've been really impressed with the way in which they're tackling. They're using um, a kind of double tackle technique where somebody goes low, somebody else goes high and tries to trap the ball. And I think we're seeing lots of dominant tackles. Um, and I'm sure you've seen Neve Jones yeah. <laughs> tackling in the Women's Six Nations. Like that is, that's textbook tackle technique. And any man that plays rugby will say, geez, that's, that's out of this world. Uh, really, really good technique. So um, the gap's definitely closing. But um, we have players like Neve Jones and, and Aoife Wafer that are, you know, heads above everyone else. And what have they done or what has their experience been that sets them apart, do you think? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think Neve's story was that her, her dad taught her tackling right. um, back in the day. She's been playing mini rugby from a very young level and playing with the boys from that age uh, probably gave her a lot of the grounding and the foundations of tackling, the kind of physical requirements. She probably is quite fearless as well and that psychological component of, oh, I'm not going to be very good at this has been probably knocked out of her because <laughs> you know she's been playing with the boys. I had a similar experience growing up where I, I played um, with the under eight boys until um, it, it, there was a females team available so uh, it definitely it's kind of a fight or flight you have to do it and um, it gives you a lot of exposure maybe in comparison to women who start playing rugby in adulthood Is that the way it should be? Do you think that people should be playing with the boys at, at under 8 and then obviously in their teens to split up? Yeah it's kind of controversial because there's lots of youth girls teams coming up now and that's really really brilliant and it gives girls an opportunity to play perhaps girls that don't want to play with boys at that level um, but I think for the skill of tackling and for actually the basic fundamentals of, of rugby skills, playing mixed rugby for as long as possible is a really, really good good thing. Um, yeah, we see it in other sports as well and it can only be the same for rugby. On the other sports thing, it's very interesting because obviously you spent some time down in Australia looking at AFL teams, rugby league teams. Rugby is often used as a sort of conversation point when we watch the NFL here even where it's like why why did the NFL lads try and tackle the way they do when they could just rugby tackle somebody it seems to make a lot more sense but you've obviously compared the tackle technique from other sports to rugby how do rugby players rugby union players that is compare in terms of their standard when it comes to the tackle I would say rugby union in comparison to say NFL or AFL they have a a lot more standardised tackle technique of kind of this is what you do pre-contact this is what you're doing in contact and this is what like a good tackle looks like. Um, but I would argue that it really depends on the context of the tackle itself and the situation that you find yourself in. I mean, um, Neve Jones making a tackle in the middle of the pitch is going to look very different to Baven Parsons making a tackle on the edge that maybe she's got 10, 15 metres to, to try and cover. So each tackle looks different. Um, but I think when you compare rugby league to rugby union, it's a totally different tackle. Yeah. Again, which makes things like transitioning from one code to the other, very, very difficult. The rugby league tackle is quite upright um, and there's two or three defenders involved generally in most of those tackles. And my understanding of it was is that it's upright so as to absorb the force of the ball carrier. And because there's no rucks, you have to try and slow that process of, you know, trapping them first and getting to ground. And there's a bit of a ground wrestle that goes on to try and like gain as many seconds as possible so that your team can get back whatever the 10 metres and, and come up again as a defensive line. So there's lots of different tactical um, components at play with the rugby league tackle. Did I read as well in your research and the work that you've been doing that the highest percentage of injuries can actually be attributed to what happens to the tackler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It appears in the women's game anyway that that, that seems to be the case. Um, it can be a combination of lots of different things like per tackle technique or physical um, differences or, or when fatigue starts to creep into things as well but we just haven't really got enough of the research yet to kind of ascertain where are we going to best target that and, and mitigate those injuries to the tackler. If you had to pick one thing that shocked you or surprised you during uh, your trip or during the, the last few months of research what is it? That shocked me. Um, that's a good question. I should have prepared for that. Um, I was shocked by the um, the amount of energy and momentum that there are, that there is in in sport and in um, media and research and all sort of spheres of of sport for um, the women's game and and there's a lot of encouragement and a lot of like momentum 
in this space. I was at the International Olymp- Olympic Consensus um, Conference on Injury Prevention in Sport and I was pre- presenting some of my qualitative research there and it seemed like every other talk was, was about women's sport, which is absolutely brilliant. It's um, a key kind of priority in their in their research agendas and um, yeah, it's really good. I felt like really energised after those conferences and, and visits. Um, it seems like there's a lot of momentum in this space, so good good vibes. Absolutely. So the academic space is really making strides when it comes to the women's game and, and it's all games really. It's not just rugby, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All sports um, and para sports and, and, and all the, the whole spectrum of, of sports um, in that area. So it's, uh, it's now hoping that the good research that has been that is being done is slowly going to get implemented into our coaching practices and um, our policies and, and rule changes and things. Brilliant, uh, Catherine. Can I ask you how, how the health is now <laughs> nowadays? And you might you might bring us back to, to, to November twenty two because it's been uh, it's been a hell of an eighteen months for you. Yeah, crazy eighteen months. Um, I can't believe it's been eighteen months actually. Uh, yeah, I'm doing really really well. I'm flying it. I'm probably the fittest and strongest that I've been ever before because I've had this time to kind of prioritise gym and, and rugby conditioning and and all the lovely stuff that I've normally been putting on the back burner before as a scrum half <laughs> 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 and getting away with it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing really well. Thank you. Can you take us back to November 22 for anybody who's listening who, who isn't familiar with your story? Yeah, sure. Um, so November 2022, I had just come back from presenting my research at a World Rugby Conference in Amsterdam. I was in Cape Town the month before that presenting research. And I'd signed a, a contract with Ireland Women's Rugby. It was kind of the first kind of cohort of players to to sign a contract. So I felt on top of the world, absolutely privileged. And uh, I was unfortunately rehabbing an ACL injury that had happened in the summer of that year. Uh, I was doing hip thrusts in the gym and I suddenly got a big headache and it turned out that um, I'd, I'd suffered a brain hemorrhage um, on the gym floor. How soon after that pain do you realise what's after happening or what are the sequence of events in the minutes afterwards? Yeah, so so I had this massive headache uh, as I was doing my hip thrusts. Luckily, I had my S&C coach, Ed Slattery, in front of me. He he saw immediately that I was in distress. He saw that my face had dropped and I had complete loss of power on my left arm and left leg. Uh, I couldn't get over how quickly things happened. Um, I was also very lucky that the men's 15s team doctor Kieran Cosgrove was at the pull-up bar behind me so so Ed got Kieran immediately and I think I was in Connolly Hospital within about 15 minutes right so it, was, it all happened very very quick I remember thinking at the time oh gosh I think this is a stroke um I had worked on a stroke ward before in Donnybrook Hospital so I kind of knew some of the signs and symptoms but I hadn't worked with somebody in the real acute stages like this so it was quite frightening but uh Weirdly enough, I tried to use a bit of humour to like <laughs> to like uh, dissipate the the kind of tension and chaos that was happening in that situation. How do you mean? I think like it's really embarrassing, but um, I said to Kieran, the the team doctor, uh, "Oh gosh, this this will make for a really interesting case study, won't it, Kieran?" <laughs> 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 like I don't know where my head was, but you were just in such a like fight or flight, pure trauma experience and that was how, how I responded was through humour and trying to look on the bright side. Did you know what it was as soon as you felt the sensation or pretty much a couple of seconds after that? Yeah, I, I suppose I did. I felt I, I felt blood kind of behind my right eye, which is crazy. Um, and that was where the the the, the AVM was. And an AVM is an arteriovenous malformation. It was a little cluster of blood vessels that decided to burst that day. Um, I, I had been born with it, but I'd never had any symptoms or anything preceding that event. So, um, yeah, I suppose I had a fair idea, but I wasn't quite sure exactly the severity of the situation. Or I felt I felt good, but I was obviously very, very unwell at that moment. Of course. Do, do you remember everything that happens then in terms of being transported to Conley Hospital in the next couple of hours? Or, or what's your consciousness like at that time? Yeah, I was fully conscious. Right. Um, fully conscious, probably not feeling very at myself. I had very, very low blood pressure. I think that's how the body responds when there's right. a bleed anywhere your blood pressure drops. So I couldn't really move. I had no power in my in my um, left arm and leg and my speech was slurred, which was oh my God. interesting and embarrassing. Um, but my friend from Dublin, Sarah, she she kindly came across town to, to see me and my parents are from up north in Fermanagh. So 
they had to come down the road two and a bit hours to to come see me. So um, I felt very fortunate that I was surrounded by really good healthcare and, and good friends and stuff at that moment. But uh, yeah, it's all a bit of a blur, to be honest. <laughs> How dangerous is the situation when you look back on it now in terms of what you're being told at the time, in terms of what your parents and, and your friend is being told at the time, uh, in terms of the severity of your own condition at that moment? Yeah, I suppose I haven't really considered how severe it was. Um, I do have to say I was massively lucky that it happened where it happened. Um, if I don't think if I had made it to Connolly in that short space of time and got the care that I needed, that um, I would have made this really good recovery. So, um, yeah, I count my blessings every day that I'm as good as I am. And to be in a room with a doctor there at that moment, it's almost ideal situation in so far as there can be any ideal situation for this to happen. It's obviously horrendous. But yeah. to be in that high performance setup, essentially, yeah. when that happens, it's it's that is the, the one lucky element in a very, very un- unlucky moment. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I live with Jenny Murphy. Um, right. <laughs> you know, Jenny. And um, I dropped her off to the airport um, at like 6am the previous morning. So I was alone in a fourth floor apartment in Smithfield. Uh, you know, if, if it had happened in my sleep or anywhere else, like God knows what would happen. So yeah, I was just absolutely right place, right time. What happens in the days and weeks after it? The days and weeks, I think I spent about uh, two weeks in Beaumont Hospital, got transferred from Connolly to Beaumont. That was where they performed, um, it's kind of like a gluing uh, surgery to try and glue up the the burst um, vessels, um, there was lots of scans and things and I was very determined to get home as quick as I could. Uh, being a 26 year old in a, a ward of older people that have just had strokes and things was really horrible. It was not not great experience. Now they, they, they gave me the best care in the world but I didn't want to find myself from going from Irish rugby gym floor to Beaumont Hospital was, was uh, a horrible shock to the system so I was keen to get home as quick as possible and I was very lucky that um, my parents had the best setup for me and uh, I was able to access kind of um, community supports back home in Fermanagh. They have like brain injury services and all sorts of things to make sure that I've got kind of all the help I need in terms of psychology, um, occupational therapy and like there's lots of stuff that happens to somebody after a stroke. So um, it's a real holistic care model. Um so I was glad that all of that was really facilitated for me. When it comes to the holistic element to all of that, is there any part of the things that you needed to do in terms of your recovery that you found the hardest or was there any element of it that, that you struggled with at that time? Um, I have to say it it, um, it was different from, from any other injury. I think when you know when it's a, an MSK injury, like a calf tear or something, you know you know the, the, the steps in the process and you know, okay, I've got you know five, six weeks of this. And I can do, you know, I'll progress. Whereas with a brain injury, it's um, <laughs> there's no real timeline and nobody's got the, the cheat codes to help you navigate the, the system. Um, I think the psychological element was probably the biggest uh, hurdle for me, was was getting over like what happened. I think as athletes, we, we try and blaze through um, tough patches. You know, we've been through highs and lows as an Irish team over the years, you know, not qualifying for that World Cup and things. And, and I got over that pretty well. I was able to compartmentalise those feelings into a box and, you know, do the Autumn Internationals after that and keep going. Whereas uh, this brain injury definitely just stops you in your tracks, stops you dead, and you have to actually give it the attention it needs. And I think that's where the psychological help was um, probably the biggest factor in my recovery, to be honest. It's just a, a pure sort of, is, is, it a, is it a loneliness? Is it it's just me dealing with this? I know you make the comparison with the Rugby World Cup thing there. You have a whole squad of people around you, I guess, who are going through the exact same feeling. Is, is, yeah. is, that, is it the, the solo nature of it all that, that makes it extra tough? Yeah, it is. It is really, really solo. Um, and nobody quite understands what way you're feeling either. Like people have had concussions and stuff. And I'd say it's like a very severe concussion is, is probably the way you feel for, probably felt like that for a good eight months or so afterwards um and people you know they 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 try really really hard to to cheer you up and and stuff but ultimately I had a lot of work to do to try and come to terms with what had happened and 
you feel a lot of anger towards like, oh, I'm 26, like this shouldn't happen to a 26 year old. Um, but in hindsight and looking back, I actually think, wow, it's probably one of the best things <laughs> that really? happened to me in terms of giving me a lot of, um, I have a lot more gratitude and a lot more better outlook on life in terms of kind of living and um, being as present as possible and living to the max. So I wouldn't be in, I don't think I would have been in Monaco and Sydney and Melbourne if uh, if it hadn't happened to me. And I've made some amazing connections and um, amazing collaborations over the 18 months right. that I've had that I probably wouldn't have had before. So it's all, it's all good. How long does it take for that mentality to change, for it to turn into gratitude? Uh, that probably took me... Probably took me about a year right. afterwards to, to get to that stage. Lots of hard work from mm-hmm. the the therapists and psychologists and stuff. God love them. But um, yeah, I think I started to realise, oh, you know what? You're you're alive and you're healthy and, and uh, you're really, really lucky to be here. So let's make the very most out of it. And I think that like has really given me a lot of energy and motivation to, to push myself. Um, I think in, like, regardless of rugby world, uh I get a lot of imposter syndrome when it comes to research for some reason. So it's nice that um, I have this new mindset because when people give me opportunities of, oh, would you mind coming to Monaco and talking about this? Or do you mind coming into Melbourne Storm and telling us about your tackle research? Uh, I um, I have a new mindset of, yeah, sure, no no, no problem. I'll say yes. Like As opposed th- to in the past, you might have I might turned have said, it down. Oh, gosh, I'm not good enough to do that. Or, really? Yeah. Yeah, or I would have used the rugby excuse of, oh, yeah, sorry, I'm Playing. training. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's so. very interesting. Yeah. <gasps> so this, in a way, the gratitude that you felt as a result of your recovery and being alive helped you deal with imposter syndrome that you would have felt prior to it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that, like, if it was, if it's uh, imposter syndrome, but I think I've just got this new m- mentality of, like, I'm going to embrace every opportunity right. that comes along and... So what if I muck it up or if I if I underperform because you know it's it's um it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. What really matters is that we're here and healthy and you've got your family around you. So that's the way I look at it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing outlook. And I do wonder as well, the like the, the psychological aspect of it is fascinating. When it comes to the physical aspect of that one year as well, you're you're also battling with the fact that you're not I guess, allowed to do the things that you used to do. And as somebody who's played the top level of her sport in her country, does that come with an extra frustration given your body's been the thing that you prided yourself on and being able to physically compete has been the thing that you prided yourself on and all of a sudden a large part of that is robbed? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think I fell into the trap of of my sole identity was Catherine Dean, Irish rugby player. And when that's suddenly taken out from underneath you, you think, God... Who am I now? You know, I'm. Uh, you start to like really undervalue yourself. Um, so when it came to the physical recovery, uh, yeah, I was back to rock bottom of of I I'd lost a lot of weight, kind of lost a lot of muscle mass. So really had to start from the very beginning. Um, and it's a, it's a challenge too for for physios and clinicians because they've never really seen this happen to a young person before. It's not. It's quite rare that it would happen so and would, would it be rarer of, for a high performance athlete to, to suffer this or is it, is it completely random in the younger cohort of individuals I think it is quite random but right. sometimes the uh, nature of high intensity sport may predispose an elite athlete to these events um, like we can it doesn't necessarily differentiate but um, there's more triggers in elite sport I suppose um, to set off these events but um, yeah so it was definitely starting from scratch and it was kind of a where are we going to go with this? And um, a lot of problem solving in the early days and, and tough decisions to be made. So um, it was a long, long process and I did find it difficult to be patient <laughs> at times. Me being a physio, like I should know better, but often we're the worst patients in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I'd say quite possibly the, the uh, worst <laughs> patients in the world. Uh, it's fascinating the thing you just said there about your identity being wrapped up in rugby for a while. Do you notice that with some of your teammates that maybe if you take the World Cup non-qualification, for example, the disappointment that comes from that, because your identity is wrapped up so much in being a rugby player, is the disappointment just way more? Is it, Does it just kind of have a devastating impact on, on how you feel as a human being for a prolonged period of time? 
totally. We put so much pressure on ourselves that like if we don't make it to this World Cup, everything that we've done in the three, four years preceding this has been a waste of time. And because we put our value on our identity being an international rugby player, we then think that other people perceive us as that as well. So they kind of look down on us as, oh, you know, failures or you're that that group that didn't make it to the World Cup, um, which is, you know, I think until you're outside of that bubble, that's when you see it. But um, when you're in it, you think, yeah, that's who I am. That's how everybody else is judging me. We're judging ourselves on that and everybody else is judging us on that standard. Maybe it's different strokes for different folks and, and all of that sort of thing. But I do wonder if there's like a, when people uh, tap into that identity, it's kind of seen as a positive in some sporting setups where it's like, you know, this is me. If I don't perform today, it's a stain on my reputation. It's a stain on us as individuals and people tap into that a little bit too much in sport or do you think it is different for each person that maybe you might have a better performance if you realize that no my identity is not wrapped up in this game I am uh, whatever I do outside of rugby I am also that person and this is not going to define who I am whereas for other people it might actually be better for them yeah absolutely and I think um, yeah that's really interesting you say that because I've noticed um, especially with Irish men's rugby that they're starting to show a lot more of Andy Farrell and his kids and you know all the players and their kids and stuff and these players are dads and that they're also they've got side hustles or they've got businesses and stuff as well and they've got family so I, I think it is important that the media and stuff showcase that yeah these people are more than just the athlete that you see and I think um in the past there's been a lot of pressure on oh that player is not on form or they're not performing well or you know x y and z and they're not um you know maybe they're not going to get selected and those sort of things I think um that was the old narrative. I think things are improving now and we are starting to look at the, the, the whole player and that they are more than just their physical attributes. They have a personality and they've got families and they've got um, all sorts of other things going on. We've got the likes of, um, you know, Sam Monaghan's and, and Nicole Fowley's that are big, big personalities. And I think thanks to like TikTok and some of the memes and things you've got, you can see that a bit more and, and maybe people are less likely to just judge them on their performance. It's a really good point. Like I was sitting in the press conference after the defeat to England and Twickenham this year in the men's Six Nations, and there's always this kind of weird tone in the press conference where like Andy Farrell and Peter Mahoney come in, and it's like it's almost like a funeral where it's like oh, I can't be. It's almost like we can't be asking about the game, but obviously you ask about the game. And somebody asked about Andy Farrell and his his grandson and uh, him wearing an, an England jersey, and it was quite a, a funny exchange. And it's like oh, actually, there's a real life thing out here, and actually the sport isn't all that important at all. Yeah, and I think bringing up. Andy Farrell is, is just such a he's just such a great exemplar of this where he's been one of the greatest Irish head coaches that uh, rugby has had. But at the same time, he also manages to put it into perspective better than a lot of other coaches would do as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And like when you bring up his, his kids, like the game of rugby is a lot more than just the World Cup and the Six Nations. Like there's the opportunities and, and um, the brilliant experiences that the game of rugby brings to young kids and, and women and people in the sport is is huge you know there's there's roles for everybody um in rugby and i think we get sometimes a little bit too fixated on world cup qualifying and and right. wages and those sort of things when actually like it's a beautiful game that can um bring a lot of joy to a lot of people um so rugby player catherine dan is only part of your uh, identity however just on that part of your identity where is she right now in terms of the rugby player yeah, so rugby player Catherine is in the end stages of her return to contact. Um, she's putting her PhD research into practice and, and trying to make sure that she's best prepared to for the match demands um, for contact. Um, I was hoping to make a return, uh, you know, th this month, but because of the trip to Monaco and Sydney and, and Melbourne, it's kind of delayed things by a little bit but uh, I'd be very very hopeful to be putting on an Ulster jersey this summer hopefully Brilliant Have you gone into contact so when you talk okay so when was the first time you took a, a, took a tackle or, or performed a tackle since uh, I suppose it would be a month ago now Right How did that feel uh, It felt great Right it felt great um, I had a little bit of apprehension in the, at the back of my mind uh, that oh hope I'll be okay um, but as soon as it happened it was like duck to water just loved it. It's uh, they, they often say it is kind of like the first few 
motions when people come back from any sort of injury is just you're not really sure if like the leg will hold up or whatever it may be. So your experience has obviously been much more severe than any of the, the classic <laughs> sports injuries. But it sounds like that first tackle and being a duck to water, it's kind of as quick as any other injury. I don't want to downplay it, obviously, yeah, but it, it, yeah. it sounds like it. Yeah, absolutely. Like I had the ACL injury to try and navigate yes. as well because that, that rehab got cut short. But um, yeah, it's like it's like ACLs, like that first um, goose step or side step that you do against somebody. You know, you'd be thinking, oof, can, can my knee hold up? But um, I knew I because of the kind of length of time and the, the coordination of the process, I knew I was definitely like ready Um I had all the, the physical work done, all the mileage done, so body was good. Just had to get down and do it. So back in with Ulster soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Do you see yourself wearing an Ireland shirt in the future? I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. Um, but I definitely won't be putting pressure on myself to, to do that. Um, definitely just going to enjoy the the rugby that I've got. Um, get get back into a Belvo jersey as well. And if the Ireland jersey comes around, that would be absolutely amazing. You've also dipped your toe into the coaching world. That's right. Can you talk us through this a little bit? Yes. So um, being that kind of type A athlete, I needed to do loads of different things whenever I was recovering from the stroke. So I thought, oh, a bit of coaching would be good. I can kind of keep myself in rugby world a little bit, but not overcommit to, to playing. And um, Dyer, if you were, were brilliant and were like, yeah, yeah, we'll get you onto a coaching course and and um, get the ball rolling on that. And then I find myself on the coaching panel with the, the Ulster women's team uh, last summer. So uh, things progressed very, very quickly. And it's actually been a really brilliant tool. I think it'll help with my playing game as well. But um, the knowledge that I've gained in coaching world has been huge. Your, uh, your experience has mostly been as a skills coach, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, yeah. I presume what you're doing in terms of your PhD, just it's a perfect marriage of, of, your, of your interests in, in that coaching role then. Absolutely, huge. Um, I've been doing video analysis as part of my PhD research as well and, and kind of studying the, the technical characteristics that, that women use to tackle um, and having that coaching background and having my connections of uh, a coaching network has really helped in maximising the, the benefit and impact of that research, hopefully. I, I had often seen a skills coach as passing and kicking, not tackling, but obviously that's not the case. Oh yeah, in, in today's game, um, a lot of teams have contact coaches. There there are like kicking coaches and passing coaches and stuff as well. But um, in the women's game anyway, the skills coach typically has to double up and do all the the wide range of, of skills. So um, given it's the most con- common contact event and kind of the game event that carries the greatest risk of, of injury, it's it's a really key area of the game that, that um, hopefully contact coaches will be getting <laughs> <laughs> the same uh, remuneration for it. Yeah. Uh, did you find that itch was scratched then when you weren't allowed to play any rugby and you were doing a bit of coaching? Did you find that you really got the the, the feeling that, you know, I'm, I'm involved in something, I'm getting the buzz of match day or whatever the situation would be from that? Like, did it fill the void, I guess? Uh, it's not quite the same as playing. Uh, I had this absolute urge to, to get on the pitch mm-hmm. <laughs> whenever I was coaching with Ulster. Um, but uh, it definitely gives you another, a different kind of high. I'd never been nervous for a rugby match ever before and being a coach I was the most nervous I've ever been it was Why so? so weird um I don't I don't know what it was it was it was kind of like I can't control what goes on here whereas as a scrum half and being a player <laughs> you feel like a little bit oh I can actually make a difference a little bit in this game um whereas when you're a coach you know it's up to the players then and you've no no control you can make a few subs and things but so it's all up to them. The scrum half is the control freak in the team, as I'm hearing here. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to Ireland and in this series, Women's Six Nations, just to, to wrap up, the performance against France seemed to be uh, a lot of positivity around that, certainly when it came to the defensive performance of the game against France. Obviously, the second game against Italy was, was so disappointing given the result and some of the errors in the game as well. Third place is not, unru- it's not impossible at this stage, but it obviously puts a lot of pressure on this weekend and it puts a lot of pressure on the last weekend in particular against Scotland what's the general feeling when you're watching them at the moment in terms of where the trajectory of the team is going I think they're definitely going in the right direction um, I was really really proud and and um, pleased to see uh, how strong their defence was um, it seems very coherent and like they're a tough team to break down um, I was also really enthused by their attack some of the offloads and and um, 
the tip-ons and, and, and kicking play that we haven't really seen in the previous years is, has really started to, to come out and the basic skills are, are definitely improving. I know there's lots of like unforced errors and things in, in the, the last game against Italy, but it's good to see them trying trying things and and um with time that like they're a young team it'll it'll come together and and um it's nice that they're still having a crack and and throwing the ball around Shuey are things fixed do you get the sense from talking to teammates or is there still a lot of work that needs to be done behind the scenes in terms of the supports that are available to this team or do you feel now it's actually just making up for lost time with the tools that they have available to them now that or do they still is there still a lot of work that needs to needs to be done yeah, I reckon looking at the bigger picture and, and looking at the domestic leagues and, and, and everything else, it all kind of needs to start to come together mm-hmm. a little bit better. Um, the talent that we have is is really, really good. It's just making sure that we've got the right structures and, and pathways in place to to capitalise on that talent. What's missing with regards to those structures and pathways? Ooh. <laughs> I don't know. If I, if I knew the answer, I, <laughs> I could make a lot of money. Um, what do I think is missing? Uh, I think I'd like to see more girls playing more rugby uh, throughout the season. I think there's a lot of a lot of different competitions on, and, and it's great. But um, it just means that, like for example, Belvedere had like ten plus players missing for for the season because of Celtic Challenge and and international selection and stuff. So it means some of the club teams are really losing out on some of their talented players, and and um, I would worry that it would kind of affect the standards of the club game hopefully not but we'll, we'll see by the the AL finals to, to to be able to back that up but um I think if we can find a little bit bit of a better structure in the um in terms of the, the club game and the interprovincial game and the Celtic challenge and the international game if that can be married together in a way right um I mean the men's game doesn't really have that problem so much like they've it seems to be a bit more succinct yeah it certainly does this weekend then Prediction for Ireland against Wales? I think it'll be close, but I definitely think Ireland will will win. Um, I'm predicting 25-15. Very good for Ireland. Yep. Very good. Catherine Dane, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for popping into the studio. When, when does the PhD finish up? Is it one of these things that's <laughs> going to take you for the next few years or uh, will, will you be free from it? At, at I, I wish. No, my four years is coming to a close this right. summer. So finishing up. Right, you're up against it so over the next uh, few months to get that yeah. in and uh, looking forward to seeing you back in the, the Ulster colours as well and uh, very best of luck with that recovery and a return to, to rugby. Uh, Catherine Dane, Irish rugby player, thanks a million for coming in. Thanks, Owen. Rugby on Off The Ball.